Alan, one of my fellow gorilla trackers, tells me about an inexpensive restaurant and hotel off the main street in Buhoma, it right outside the National Park gates. Alan learned about the restaurant from the Buwindi National Park Rangers who eat here daily. I was a little hesitant and reluctant because I'd never been to a hotel and restaurant with chickens in the courtyard. The restaurant is actually Mrs. Hope's living room and the hotel, several spare bedrooms in the back of the house. A Bawindi National Park ranger eating dinner recommends a local favorite dish called chapati. Alan, what, what are we ordering? Oh. And two chapatis, two fried eggs, and one tomato. And how, much, and how much is it going to cost? Uh, I guess. About 2000 Yeah, about 2000 Maybe a dollar? Yeah, a dollar. Chapati is a flat, unleavened bread similar to pita bread, and when rolled with eggs inside, it's called the Rolex. Now, this is the chibale. What is this? Chapati. Chapati. So, this is video. This is Mrs. Hope, the hotel owner and restaurant cook. My name is Ganavas Hope. I leave Bawindi National Park and start the last phase of my safari, heading back to Entebbe. I pack up my gear, get on the road, and start the long and sometimes dangerous drive back. As we were driving through Queen Elizabeth National Park, we came across a strange and unusual sight, a lone baboon walking along the road. At first I thought he was begging for food, but when he didn't even stop or acknowledge us, I realized he was an outcast. After several hours of driving, we reach Fort Portal, an important market town in western Uganda. The town is situated between the Roranzori and Kabali National Park. It's also the halfway point between Bawindi and Kampala. We arrive in Kakabara, the commercial center of central Uganda. It's located halfway between Fort Portal and Kampala. The first thing I notice about this city is its air pollution from the hundreds of scooters, which makes breathing almost impossible. We drive through Kakabara in a hurry and then are back on the open road, dealing with all its perils of dust and speeding buses. We're tired, hungry, thirsty, and running out of gas. So Duwata pulls up to his favorite truck stop for a sit down and a meal. Instead of the low hum of city noises, we are deafened by a loudspeaker blaring out some advert for some new soft drink. I pick up a menu and look at my choices. I don't recognize anything, so I decide to have whatever Duwata is having. My plate arrives and I ask Duwata, what am I eating? He tells me the white paste is posha, a corn flour paste, goat stew, rice, and matoke, which are mashed bananas. I'm starving, so I dig in and eat everything right down to the plate. I am curious as to why I see so many Mitsubishi Fuso trucks with kanji text on them. Duwada tells me Ugandans cannot afford to buy a new car or truck and import vehicles from Japan that fail their strict nitrous oxide emissions testing. The vehicles are bought at auction and exported to Kenya, the biggest importer, and then Uganda and finally Tanzania. It starts to rain and I am grateful as it cools and removes the red dust from the air. The downside is it causes the roads to be slick and dangerous, especially when passing big and fast tractor trailers. After several more hours, we arrive at the edge of Kampala and its notorious traffic jams. Luckily for us, after a few minutes, the traffic jam breaks up and we are driving at normal speeds and heading towards the hotel. I see several fires along the roadside and I assume it must be trash day as this is the third trash heap I've seen on fire. Before sunset, the sky will be filled with smoke and breathing will become difficult. It's late and I finally arrive at the American Recreational Association. I'm grateful for the peace and quiet of the inner courtyard and ordered dinner. The waiter informed me the only item available on the menu at this time is tilapia. 
I've been eating tilapia for lunch and dinner this past week and was looking forward to something different. Luckily for me, tilapia is not on the menu for breakfast and I thoroughly enjoy a traditional English breakfast. I am in Kampala and the airport is in Entebbe, so I take a 45 minute cab ride and arrive with plenty of time to spare. The Entebbe International Airport is small with one runway pointed towards the lake. Boarding and unboarding the plane is simple. The plane pulls up, the doors open, stairs are rolled up, and people walk from the plane to the terminal. Hopefully, it's not raining. As I'm standing around the terminal, I notice a lot of white planes at the far end of the runway and ask a clerk. She tells me it's the UN World Food Program flying supplies into the Congo's eastern provinces of Kivu, Katanga, and Ituri to feed 4.2 million internally displaced people. My British Airway flight finally arrives, and I'm happy to see the brand new gleaming Airbus 320. We patiently wait for the incoming passengers to unload, then are eager to board ourselves. I find my seat in the very back of the plane by the bathrooms, sit down, and reflect on my incredible journey. As I watch Uganda fade away into the distance, I am sad my safari has come to an end and am very grateful for what I have seen. As an end note to my Ugandan safari, I read an article in the April 29, 2010 edition of the Wall Street Journal that Tallow Oil of London, England had found Africa's biggest oil field in decades a 2 billion barrel oil reserve in the Albertine Rift Valley, which includes Lake Albert and Murchison Falls National Park. According to the Wall Street Journal, Murchison Falls National Park is Uganda's biggest tourism draw and revenue generator, home to elephants, giraffe, lions, and rare birds. The drilling in the national parks has created a conflict between two Ugandan ministries and pitted the Energy Ministry's Petroleum Exploration and Productions Department against the Ministry of Tourism, Trade and Industries, Ugandan Wildlife Authority. Ugandan Wildlife Authority Coordinator Edgar Buhanga testified to Parliament that toxic waste from the oil exploration and increased human presence at Murchison Falls National Parks are killing animals. He further said that most of the petroleum perspective areas lay in a protected area which are a major source of income for the country, and that reports show several animals have died or been killed in Murchison Falls, Kabali, Roranzori, and Queen Elizabeth National Parks. The reason Murchison Falls is important is that it's a national park and a UN World Heritage Site for the habitat protection of rare birds, plants, and animals found nowhere else on the African continent. The park is still reeling and recovering from wildlife massacres by troops under Idi Amin in the 1970s and modern-day poachers selling bushmeat to foreign countries. Robert Cassande, spokesman for the Petroleum Exploration and Production Department, said, As I see it, drilling will happen where there is oil. It's just a technical issue. There is no area too sensitive to accommodate oil development. According to journalist Mark Jardal, the Ugandan government stands to make billions and has been ranked by Transparency International as one of the more corrupt countries in the world. Quote, in a case of the fox guarding the hen house, the ministry responsible for monitoring environmental impacts of oil exploration feels there is no place for third party independent monitoring. Unquote. Having read about Nigerian government officials embezzling and laundering money into secret bank accounts, and the disastrous handling of environmental incidences, I am concerned for the future of the national parks of Uganda. <laughs>